the Golden Rule of Interpretation. For those of you who do not know what this is, just listen along and try and pick it up week by week. This is basically a rule of how you interpret the Bible so that you don't misinterpret it, basically. Um, and it goes something like this. When the plain sense of scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word in its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning, unless the facts of the immediate context, certain words of related passages, and axiomatic and fundamental truths indicate clearly otherwise. Okay, well, good evening. Good evening. Tonight we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 4. And uh, before we do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray this evening that you'd speak to us through this chapter of the book of Daniel. Please help us to understand it. Lord, you were there, we were not. You know these people, you know this man. So Lord, please help us tonight to understand what's going on. Lord, give us revelation. Please open our ears to hear what your spirit is saying. Open our eyes to see what you want us to see. And we pray, Lord, for everything that's said and shared and spoken. This evening, your Holy Spirit, Lord God, would overshadow and indwell everything. For the glory of Jesus, your Son, we pray. Amen. 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 And we're going to be looking tonight at Daniel chapter 4. And we're going to begin verses 1 to 8. Dawn and Sinead. Nebuchadnezzar, dream of a tree. <clears throat> King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and the people of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home, in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream that they could not interpret for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He is called Belshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the Holy Ghost is in him. I said, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the Holy Ghost is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on all and on, on it was food for all. Under it the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while I in bed I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter it its fruit. Then the animals flee from under it, and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots, bound in iron and bronze, remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him live with the animals amongst among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let he be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The Holy One declares the verdict, so that the living may know that the Most High is the sovereign over all kingdoms on earth, and gives them 
open to anyone who wishes and sets them over a low risk of people. How far are we? Up to 18. Okay. This is the dream that I, Nebuchadnezzar, have. Now, Belshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Okay, thank you. So this chapter is now dealing with the pride, the arrogant pride of King Nebuchadnezzar and God's judgment and discipline of this pride. And the reason God does this is to show the world that he is the one and only true sovereign who controls the affairs of man. In verses 1 to 3, Nebuchadnezzar is pleased to send out a letter to the whole kingdom. This, of course, is the kingdom of Babylon, a proclamation. And in his proclamation, he greets the people with peace and prosperity. And he wants to relate the signs and wonders and miracles that he has seen uh, Daniel's God perform. He calls him the Most High. And King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges four primary things about the Most High God. Number one, his signs are great. Number two, his wonders are mighty. Number three, his kingdom is everlasting. Number four, his dominion is from generation to generation. And in this proclamation, he writes three things. There are three things to note. Um, first thing to note is that Daniel may well have drafted this letter uh, or uh, wrote this letter down as Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dictated the letter to him. The reason for this is because in verses um, 3 and 30 um, and 7, uh, there are biblical statements that Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't have known. They're Hebrew statements from the Hebrew Bible that Daniel himself would have known and would have written in there. Um, number two, the pride of chapter 3 of building the huge golden <coughs> image in rebellion to God. Uh, why did he build the gold image, by the way? Can anybody remember? So his kingdom was everlasting. He did it in... Yes. Against the, the, the dream of the... Uh, the yeah, so the dream of um, chapter one of the head of gold, which is Babylon, Medo Persia, silver, mm. um, uh, the Hellenistic Empire, the Grecian, uh, the belly of bronze, and the Roman Empire, the legs of iron. Um, God says there's going to be four successive empires, and in the fourth empire, the kingdom of God is going to be set up and established, the Roman Empire. Of course, that's when Christ came and established the kingdom. And it was only the head of gold that represented the Babylonian Empire. And so in rebellion to the revelation that God gave to Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar erected a huge image and made the whole thing of gold, basically saying... There aren't going to be other empires or kingdoms coming after me. I am the main kingdom and empire, and uh, my empire will never come to an end. Now he's acknowledging there is only one eternal, everlasting kingdom and empire, that is the kingdom and empire of Almighty God. And so now the pride of chapter 3 is going to be judged in chapter 4. Could somebody read very quickly Job 33, 14 to 18? For God does speak now one way, now another, though no one perceives it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on people, as they slumber in their beds, he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings to turn them from their wrongdoing and keep them from their pride, to preserve them from the pit, their lives from perishing by the sword. So how are we told that God speaks to us? In visions? in dreams, in one way or another. And here we're being told that God will speak once, he will speak twice, he will speak a third time to save us from perishing in the pit. This is now Nebuchadnezzar's third time that God will speak. And it's the last time God will speak in this way before God brings divine judgment upon him. Again, the reason God brings divine judgment in this life is not to damn us to hell, it is to prevent us from going there. And so this is why in the scriptures you'll often see God warning his people of physical judgment to save them from spiritual judgment. And so you'll see this 
with the sin of Kadesh Barnea, where they're wandering around the wilderness for 40 years. You'll see this in the New Testament church with striking down with people like Ananias and Sapphira. The Corinthian Christians were being put to death by the Lord. This was so that they wouldn't um, lose reward in eternity. And so God will certainly discipline us in this life and bring judgment upon us physically in this life in order to spare us from going to the pit in the next. And so this is very important. This is part of the character and the nature of God. He is a shepherd who disciplines his sheep. And so we're told that the context is that the king, this is King Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in his own palace. And God again sends him a fearful dream. In Aramaic, which is what this is written in, it says extreme terror of fright. Extreme terror of fright. He is very, very frightened by this dream. And when you look at the context of the dream, it's not that frightening. It's a tree being chopped down. How many of you have had sleepless nights over that sort of dream before? <laughs> so there is something more to this than just a tree being chopped down. God sends terror upon him as he's seeing this dream, as he's having this vision of the night. And so he calls in his wise men and his enchanters. Uh, this is an official decree. They come in. And this time he doesn't hide the dream from them. He tells them the dream and he asks them, to interpret what the dream means, a tree being chopped down, but they are not able to do so. Finally, Daniel is called, and again, he is named after his god, Bel, Belteshazzar, and he believes that the spirit of the gods is in Daniel, which means that Nebuchadnezzar, although he now believes in the God of Israel, he believes in Yahweh, he is still a polytheist. He is still a polytheist. Yahweh is just one of the gods in his pantheon of gods and goddesses, mm. which means he's still an unsaved uh, person. In the Old Testament, to be saved, you have to have faith in the God of Israel alone. Mm. It's always salvation by faith, always has been, always will be, but the content of that faith is different. In the Old Testament, you have to believe in the one true God, and uh, that would save you. He is not believing solely in the one true God, but in many gods and goddesses and so Nebuchadnezzar shares the dream in the dream he sees a huge tree that roots and all that might be one of those uh, things where the branch has been chopped off two lines okay you you got all I'll admit it's no Bob Ross, but it's, <laughs> it's alright. Um, so he sees a, a vision of a tree, and then a holy watcher comes down. This is an angel, and he chops the tree down so that only the stump is left. And then this stump is uh, chained up in iron and bolted into the ground. So the stump is going nowhere. Does, does it, by the way, those of you who know your Bible quite well, do you know anywhere else in the Bible where it talks about a stump that's going to bring forth mm -hmm. a shoot and it will be the branch? Jesse. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the book of Isaiah. And what's that talking about, the stump of Jesse? A new shoot, isn't that the... The new shoot coming out of the stump of Jesse is the Messiah. <coughs> that in the context. So what does a stump represent, do you think? From that to that. Okay. So the tree when it's fully grown, reaching the heights of heaven. That's kind of like the, the <coughs> majesty, the grandeur, the elevation, the kind of, you know, being at the top of your game. Mm -hmm. cut down. And then being chopped down. Everything being stripped. Everything being stripped back, being judged, being brought lowly. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at the prophecy in Isaiah about the stump of Jesse, what's that telling you about David's kingdom at that time, when the Messiah's going to appear? <laughs> the kingdom of David is going to be pretty much <laughs> shot down and gone. Yeah. And you come to the first century, and Jesus appears, what's the kingdom of David like? <laughs> they're, <in> one. <laughs> they're pretty much at one. So that's kind of a prophecy in Isaiah that I'm slipping in there. But we're going to come back to the book of Daniel. And this tree represents King Nebuchadnezzar. <coughs> the holy angel has come down to chop the tree down. 
and Nebuchadnezzar is going to be humbled, he is going to be reduced, and he is going to be brought low. Next, we're told that he is to live among the animals with the mind of an animal for seven times. Seven times. Now, in the ancient world, if you ever wondered why you've got 360 degrees on a, what are they called? Compass, protractors, are they? Whatever, I don't know. 360, 360 <coughs> in the ancient world was called a time. That's what that was called. 360, a unit of 360 is called a time. Um, this is why when you come to the book of Revelation, it says time, times, and half of the time. The time. A time is any unit of 360. So when you come to the book of Revelation, for instance, when it talks about a time, times, and half a time, that's 360. What's 360 times 2? 720. What's 360 halved? 180. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> when you add all of those up, you get three and a half years in the Jewish calendar, for instance. So a time, times, and half a time is three and a half years. The tribulation period in the book of Revelation is seven years, and so it always talks about the time times half times the first three and a half years leading up to the resurrection of the two witnesses and the final time times and half time leading up to the second coming of Jesus. Now we're told that Nebuchadnezzar is going to be um, driven from the kingdom, he's going to be driven from the empire for seven times, which is how many years? Seven years. Seven years. Okay. We're driven from his empire for seven years. And this decision is pronounced by the holy messengers. And this is so that he will learn that the most high is the possessor of the heavens and the earth. He's sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth. And he gives them to whoever he wishes and sets the lowliest of people in place. And so Nebuchadnezzar asked Daniel to interpret this, as the wise men had not. And he believes that the spirit of the holy gods is inside of Daniel. So once again, he is a polytheist. He's still not acknowledging that it's Yahweh giving revelation to Daniel. But rather, it's the spirit of the holy gods that are doing it. Okay, okay let's have a look then at verses 19 to 27. Who would like to read? Daniel, also called Belshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, as his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream replied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals and having nesting places in its branches for the birds. Your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger coming down from the heavens and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field with its root, while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and give them to anyone who wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, <coughs> be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that your prosperity will continue. Thank you very much. So, Daniel goes away, and God gives him revelation concerning this dream of a tree being chopped down. And Daniel is perplexed by the dream. He is terrified by the dream. 
It's not he doesn't understand the dream, he does. He, he, un it. he understands the interpretation, but he doesn't want to share it with the king. Mm -hmm. And once again, it's not that Daniel's frightened for his life, he knows that God can rescue him. It's that by this time, he's developed a relationship with the king, he's worked closely with the king, and he doesn't want to share such bad news with him. But the king reassures Daniel not to be terrified. And again, he says, this is a terrible dream and may it be applied to your enemies and not to you. The trio king is you, for you have become a great king and your greatness has reached the distant parts of the earth. But the interpretation is, is that the tree will be <coughs> cut down and will turn into a stump. You will be driven away from among men. You shall live with the wild animals. You shall eat grass. You shall be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven years shall pass by with you in this state until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the world. <coughs> and the kingdom shall be restored to you only when you acknowledge that heaven rules. That's the meaning of the chopped down tree with the stump remaining <coughs> and it being fastened with iron shackles and um, it means it's going to be chopped down, yes, but Nebuchadnezzar is not going to be uprooted. He will one day return to the throne and the tree will grow again, but this time in true humility and not in pride. And so Daniel now encourages King Nebuchadnezzar to do three things. Number one, renounce your sin. The reason the judgment of God is coming is because of his arrogant pride renounce your sin. Number two, do what is right. He has a conscience. He knows the difference between the right and the wrong. He's choosing the wrong. Number three, be kind to the oppressed. And then maybe God will continue your prosperity without bringing judgment upon you. Of course, God now will give Nebuchadnezzar a grace period. A prophetic revelation has been given to him. He has been instructed as to how to alleviate this coming judgment. He now has a choice. He can obey the words of the prophet Daniel, repent, <coughs> do what is right, and look after the oppressed, or he can continue in his pride and arrogance. And so God will now give him 12 months grace period. During this grace period, God is encouraging him to repent. At the end of this grace period, if he has not repented, then judgment will fall. And you will see this throughout scripture. This mm. is consistent with mm. God. But it's also a dangerous thing. Grace can also be dangerous. Mm. Because grace can also make you believe you've gotten away with it. Yeah. 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 I'm sinning away. Nothing's happening. God must be okay with it. I feel okay with it. <coughs> no, you're under a grace period. Judgment or discipline is coming. Mm -hmm. You've got a certain amount of time to repent. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, one day, boom, illness will strike. Or something will happen in your life mm -hmm. that will bring you low. And it's because your grace period has ended. <coughs> God did this with the Canaanites for 400 years. Canaanites were warned to stop their child sacrificing, to stop their bestiality, to stop all their wickedness. Because one day God was going to send the Israelites against them when they come out of Egypt. But the Canaanites thought, hey, God's doing nothing about it, we're going to carry on. And then Joshua turns up 400 years later. Right? Over and over again, God warns, God warns, God warns. But will we listen? They didn't listen to Jesus of Nazareth, and after three and a half years of him preaching to them, and then being warned by John the Baptist, God sends Rome against them and obliterates the Jewish people. And they are scattered now all over the world. And their temple no longer stands because they rejected Jesus of Nazareth and his warnings. And so this is true for you. And this is true for me. That if we persist in known willful sin, God will give you a grace period to repent. But when that time limit is up, Judgment or discipline will fall upon your life. So if you know right now, for instance, you're living in willful sin, you're doing something that you know is against God's law, and you are persisting in it, you will only persist in that for a certain amount of time. It's best to repent now 
and get right with God than to fall into the hands of the living God. Yep. Let's have a look at then verses 28 to 37. And uh, Bridget, would you like to read? Um, <clears throat> when he was fulfilled, when all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar, twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is this not the great Babylon I have built as a royal residence by my ma mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from the people and will live with wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by to you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. <clears throat> At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honoured and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does what he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honour and splendour re were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisers and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became the great prince before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Amen. Wow. Brilliant. So, okay, so he's had the vision of the tree being cut down, he's been terrified, he's had Daniel now speaking to him, encouraging him to repent of his sin, and to do what is right and to look after the oppressed. Now 12 months has gone by and there's been no visions or dreams or anything since. And he thinks he's gotten away with it. And so now he's up on the palace roof, he's looking out over the empire, over, his, over the buildings, and he begins to glory in his own building, his own power, his own majesty. And he begins to boast in himself and he's bragging about his own achievements. And interestingly enough, archaeologists have unearthed in this area uh, two such boastings of King Nebuchadnezzar. And these read, and these are obviously found on tablets from um, Babylon. Boasting number one, then I built the palace, the seat of my royalty, the bond of the peace of men the dwelling of joy and rejoicing. So that's the first brag that archaeologists have discovered in Babylon. Number two, Nebuchadnezzar has been discovered saying this, in Babylon, my dear city, which I love, was the palace, the house of wonder of the mm. people, the bond of the land, the brilliant place, the abode of majesty in Babylon. Okay, so archaeologists have discovered two such braggings of King Nebuchadnezzar, which confirm his attitude revealed here in the scriptures. And you can understand why he did brag and boast about Babylon. It's a very impressive city. It was 15 miles square. It was surrounded by two walls that were 350 feet high. They were also 87 feet wide at the base. Four chariots could ride along the top of these walls, and it was surrounded by a deep moat. The city had 12 gates and 12 wide streets. It had a processional street of 1,000 yards long, decorated by enamel brick with 120 lions, which is the symbol of the goddess Ishtar, where we get the word Easter from. 
It had 575 dragons, which was the symbol of Marduk, 575 bulls, which was the symbol of Bel, and the Ishtar Gate, which you can go to Berlin and see, you can actually see it on uh, Google, actually, if you type it in, but it's now in uh, East Berlin, led to the largest temple in the city, the Temple of Marduk. The city had more than 50 pagan temples in it, and the river Euphrates ran through the center of the city. And the estimated population of the city of Babylon was 1,200,000 people. So you can get from that just how large a city it was. If you want to compare, I think Gloucestershire is that 250,000 people? A bit more than that? Okay, so you've got Babylon with 1,200,000 people. An enormous city indeed. But do you find anything similar in there with the 12 gates and the river running through the center of the main temple? Yeah. What does that sound like to you? That sounds like the new uh, the new Jerusalem. The, the, right, the Jerusalem of the book of Revelation, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's founded yeah. upon that ancient pattern of having a river running through with trees, a temple in the center, 12 gates around the outside. Okay, so this is kind of what it is, uh, is based on there. Okay, so this incident occurred towards the end of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Nebuchadnezzar reigned for 43 years, and he relaxed from his, uh, or he relaxed from war, at the, in his 30th year of reign. So this occurred after that, when he was in his palace at rest and at peace. This is when this incident occurred. As he's walking along, boasting and bragging about all of the buildings, a voice speaks from heaven, and uh, the decreed judgment now falls upon him, and he's immediately driven from among men to eat grass or straw like an ox of the field. He is drenched with the dew of heaven, and his hair now becomes matted and looks like eagle's feathers, and his nails are like the claws of a bird. Now, for those of you who have done this course before, what is this illness called? I can't remember. Oh. I knew it. Oh. <laughs> Okay, if you play Scrabble, this would be an awesome triple word score. <laughs> okay, so it's called Insania, Zoo, and Throp, Throp, If, Cut. Insania, Zoo, and Throp, If, well, maybe, I don't know, somebody might zoo, maybe just to get on the point at the end. Um, so Insania Zoanthropica, it's called, and the particular malady that he has in Insania Zoanthropica is called boanthropy. Mm. Boanthropy, the belief that you're a cow <laughs> or an ox. It is a real yeah. medical condition that people still have today, and... Raymond Harrison recites a personal experience uh, with a reasonably modern case, we're talking 1946, uh, in a British mental institution. Harrison writes, this is uh, somebody who investigated this in 1946, a great many doctors spend an entire busy professional career without once encountering an instance of the kind of monomania described in the book of Daniel. But the present writer, therefore, considers himself particularly fortunate to have actually observed a clinical case of zoanthropy in a British mental institution in 1946. The patient was in his early 20s, who reportedly had been hospitalized for five years. His symptoms were well developed on admission and diagnosis was immediate and conclusive. He was of average height and weight with good physique and was in excellent bodily health. His mental symptoms included pronounced antisocial tendencies, and because of this, he spent the entire day from dawn to dusk outdoors in the grounds of the institution. His daily routine consisted of wandering around magnificent lawns with which the otherwise dingy hospital situated was graced, and it was his custom to pluck up and eat handfuls of the grass as he went along. On observation, he was seen to discriminate carefully between grass and weeds. That's something, isn't it? 
<laughs> and on inquiry from the attendant, the writer was told the diet of his patient consisted exclusively of grass from the hospital lawns. Mm -hmm. He never ate institutional food with the other inmates, and his only drink was water. The writer was able to examine him uh, cursorily, and the only physical abnormality noted consisted of a lengthening of the hair and a coarse, thickened condition of his fingernails. Without institutional care, the patient would have manifest manifested precisely the same physical conditions as those mentioned in Daniel 4.33. From the foregoing, it seems that the author of the fourth chapter of Daniel was describing accurately an attestable, if rather rare, mental affliction. So this is what King Nebuchadnezzar was afflicted by, uh, or judged by, with God, in Sania, Zoo, and Propheta. And the next time we do this in a couple of years, mm -hmm. I expect you all to remember <laughs> that word. Okay, and again, his particular malady is boanthropy, the belief mm -hmm. that you're a ox or a cow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so did Nebuchadnezzar really have this malady? I mean, it's a real medical condition, we know that, but did he really have it in history? Well, yes. Three people actually quote um, this malady in Nebuchadnezzar's life. The first is Josephus, and he is quoting from a Babylonian historian named Barassus, who mentions this strange malady that was suffered by King Nebuchadnezzar. There is also the testimony of Abidenus, who is a Greek historian who lived in 268 BC, who mentions a strange malady, as well as the prayer of uh, King Nabonidus, who mentions a strange malady as well in Babylon. At the end of the seven years, King Nebuchadnezzar looked up to heaven and acknowledged the God of heaven. So the seven times have now passed, sanity is restored to his mind, he looks up uh, after this seven year prolonged judgment from God, and he begins to acknowledge the true God, the God of heaven. He acknowledges that God is sovereign, he has an eternal dominion, he does what he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back the hand of Yahweh, no one can question Yahweh. After acknowledging this, his sanity is restored, and the advisors and the nobles seek him out, and he is restored to his throne. And in his final years, he becomes even greater than he was before, and now he acknowledges and praises the God of Daniel, the God of heaven. We call him Yahweh today. Mm. Any questions you yeah. have? Yeah, that's one of the Yeah, So within scripture, often you'll see um, trees, and mountains are symbols of pride, kingdoms, kingdoms. 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 Oh. yeah, kingdoms or things being chopped down. Go to the New Testament, you see Jesus mm -hmm. shares a parable about the kingdom of God, and he says it starts off very, very small, but it grows into a large tree. Okay. And what's his final state going to be like? Who who begins to nestle in the branches? Birds, 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 birds of the air. Yeah. And according to the first parable, what are the birds? Demonic. 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 Demons, yeah. So this is why in the end times, um, the apostles warned that the church would become infiltrated by these deceiving spirits and yeah. false teachers and liars and yeah. people who seared their conscience and stuff like that. Because it starts in Jerusalem, it grows large and has grown all over the world. We're, we're heading towards the end times. And at this time, we start to get all these false teachers and teachings coming into the church, the dark birds of the air. So we have to be very, very careful with that. But what you'll find throughout scripture is that images are used consistently of the same thing. So you don't really have to guess what these things mean. Dark birds represent demons, trees and mountains represent kingdoms. So when we come to the book of Revelation soon, as we go through, the symbols are relatively easy to interpret, so long as you know the Old Testament prophets quite well, and you understand the teaching of Jesus. Swarms like kings and stuff. 